oneheaven, one O-N-E hyphen heaven.org. And uh, on the homepage, click on positive law. When you get there, uh, change please the word uh, positive to cognitive, C-O-G-N-I-T-I-V-E. And if you do that, you'll see that the canon should come up uh, on, on the site there. Well, I've been saying to you all for some weeks now that the canons of cognitive law would be finished. And I keep also apologizing week after week. And I am sorry that these have taken a lot, lot longer than I even I expected. But to put it in perspective, in their system, we see the word parliament. We see the word govern meant we see the word environment we see the word document and what is the common element in those four crucial words words that are essential in their system that's right the the, the common element is meant mentis mind latin for mind so in their system, I would suggest the heart of their system is to divide your mind, to trick your mind, to keep your mind distracted. Their rule on power depends upon their ability to manipulate your mind. And if cognitive law is about the laws of mind, and it is, then the reason this has been taking so long is that these elements are absolutely fundamental to the future. The future of what we're doing with law, the future of what we do with society, the future of knowing who we are and what we are. So I want to go through some of those sections with you because I feel that they play a very, very important part of the laws and what we're doing. When you go through, uh, you'll see that the sections uh, to date are divided, divided into mind, which we call psi, biological systems, we call psi bio, then into uh, mind development, psi dev, and then you'll see mind influence, which is still being developed. The reason we say mind influence and not mind control in case some people say, well, why, why call it mind influence and not mind control? The reason we don't say mind control is that the concept of mind control is in itself a mind virus. If you believe that someone can control your mind, then you believe someone can take away your free will. And that is one of the great lies and therefore one of the great mind viruses of the 20th century, the belief that mind control is possible. Now, people can be influenced and put into a state of such distress and such influence that effectively it appears that they have mind control. But the reality is that there is no such way that your free will can ever be permanently removed from you. And because of that, there is no permanent concept of mind control. It is a lie, but one that is being perpetuated, believe it or not, by having people write huge screeds on huge programs of mind control. And the reason that they promote that is to believe that they have the power to take your free will from you. They have the power to traumatize you, and they do. We'll talk about that in a moment. They have the power to lie to you, and they do. They do it all the time. They have the power to fill your mind full of mind viruses, and they do. But they don't have the power to control your mind. They don't have the power to take your free will from you. Let's have a look through some of these key areas. As I say, in the, in the 35 or 20-odd minutes that we've got left, just to share some of the important elements in here and what it means. One of the first things about mind that is exceptionally important, I believe, and we, we covered this before in previous chats, but I want to come back to it, is the idea that your mind 
continues beyond death and that your mind is made up of more than just simply the elements that reflect the physical apparatus. So within the physical apparatus, we say in Nucada that you have three brains and we'll talk about those three brains in a moment. You do, in fact, have three brains and I'll explain what each of them are and why each of them are. But that is all part of the apparatus of your lower mind. What we do here when we describe uh, the concepts in Article 5 of the conscious and 6 of the interconscious, then the subconscious, and then the superconscious and ultraconscious, is that your mind is not just your lower mind, but is also your higher mind and your divine mind. And your higher mind and your divine mind are absolutely separate from your body. And those cannot be um, uh, killed and those live beyond the death of the body. The lower mind is intimately connected to the function of the body. And when the body ceases, the lower mind transitions to the higher mind. But the higher mind and the divine mind are immortal. You are immortal. You who identify yourself, you who say the word I to think who you are, to think the thoughts you are, are immortal and can never die. Another description that we do, very important, and I bring this into discussion again, is the concept of living more than one life. Another thing that they introduced to, to really trap us into a sense of fear is that this is the only life you lead and that if your flesh vessel is destroyed, that that is the only opportunity that you have as a divine mind to experience life. That's absolute rubbish. Complete and utter rubbish. In fact, I was influenced by that mind virus for a long time in my life. I believed for most of my life that, that fear. That once you die, that's it. You live one life, that's it. If you're still born, too bad. If you're born into a, a body riddled with disease, too bad. If you only live to the age of four, too bad. That's all you live. Well, that kind of thinking didn't exist 2,000, 3,000 years ago. In fact, 3,000 years ago, the overwhelming understanding, the common belief of everybody was that when you die, yes, that's the end of that unique experience for the higher mind, the lower mind transitioning, but the divine mind can be connected to another life and in another unique experience of its choosing. We can live more than one life, that which is our highest self, our divine self, our, our divine uh, mind. But to control us, an alternate theory came into play, and that theory was that if you die at any of those stages, that's it. What caused me to change before I even got to this and I've mentioned this before but I'll, I'll mention it again was when I was looking at the number of potential uh, lives that could possibly have lived between 10,000 BCE and the uh, present and when I did the numbers on that the figure that came out blew me away the figure that came out to me was at least a hundred billion that's B for billion, 100 billion flesh vessels at least would have lived the time from 10,000 BCE to the present. With that kind of number, when I thought about two things, the fact that nature abhors waste and the waste it hates the most is waste of knowledge, there is no way, there is no way that nature would permit that for 100 billion vessels, there was 100 billion um, divine spirits and that divine spirits could not come back to another vessel. When I saw that number, it became apparent to me, overwhelming to me, that my ancestors were right and that all our ancestors were right. We, our divine selves, have experienced, in most cases, more than one life. So if you've experienced more than one life, if your flesh vessel, yes, being temporary, if you can never die and you can experience life again, 
and if you're true to yourself, you can reconnect yourself and know who you are, then what do you really have to fear in this life? What do you have to fear? And we've had this in previous chats when I spoke to you about virtue conquers peril. To live a virtuous life is to, to potentially live a life free of fear. The reality is the only thing we have to fear is the mind viruses that they infect us with. The only thing we have to fear is the concepts of fear that they feed us. Fear itself is the only thing we have to fear. So if we can understand what they're doing to us, and if we understand who and what we are, then yes, even if we are facing jail, yes, if we're facing poverty, yes, if we're facing a terminal illness, we can free ourselves of those crippling fears, those fears that they infect us with, they use to sap our energy. They use to convince us that they control us. So I hope you look at those early sections there under section two of Mind Sai. I mentioned article six, seven, or five, six, seven, eight, nine. Look at those because I do believe they provide a liberation to us, an understanding of who and what we are that we may not have experienced before. Maybe if we've studied Buddhism, Maybe if we've studied some of these other ancient belief systems, we might have some of that. But in many respects, as I had myself in my background, I had become convinced by the mind viruses that they had shared with me that this is the only life and that once it's gone, it's over. I want to talk about some of the other uh, areas of this, uh, of cognitive law. And again, I hope you go through and have a look at these. We talk about the aspects of comprehension. We talk about the aspects of volition or choice. We talk about the aspects of communication. But what I want to look at is, is one that is an understanding of ourselves. And I do this because one of the things that the ruling elite want and desperately want to do is to convince you and divide you so that you are disconnected from your physical much less your ethereal and higher selves. So when I spoke before, we're talking at a high level. Let's go back to the, the, the grassroots level. And I want to talk about Article 79, Neurological Systems, which is 3.2 Neurological Systems of Biological Systems. So when you look at Article 79 of, of Neurological Systems, uh, under Canon 1146, what we say is that there are three possible neural systems and only three and any level five life form like we are actually possesses uh, these three the first is the cyto cyto neural system the second is the orgo neural system the third is the cogno neural system now when we mean the cyto neural system we're talking about the ancient system the ancient system the first system that is actually part of our body today and that's the and called the enteric nervous system and it, it is actually represented by your intestine and your colon what most people don't realize is that the large intestine and the small intestine in their body actually is the third most dense location of neuron material in their body there are over 120 million neurons located in the large and the small intestine and in fact science even admits present science admits that they call this your second brain your stomach is your second brain well how is this possible and why well if you look at Eucadia and you go through the, the canons although they, they get a bit complicated I know but if you go look and have a look and see at level three life simple life the template of simplest life of all life at that level of the worm another type uh, simple life at that level is that neurons are designed to help coordinate the breakdown of matter and that the first and most important system that you see in all the simplest of life is digestion the digestive system because if you can't eat 
you can't process.